speak about the unconscious. I just thought it, it sounded good. The unconscious, um, which, just for the record, precedes uh, old, uh, Dr. Sigmund Freud. He was not the one that uncovered the unconscious. Um, it was his mother, actually. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, um, it was actually his mother's 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 mother. Go back all the way to the time of the Bible. So it's definitely a Jewish concept um, that originates from um, from uh, antiquity. Even in the Bible itself, references are made to the unconscious. And definitely when you go into the Kabbalah, mysticism, Jewish mysticism, uh, there, there is elaborate and extensive discussion of the unconscious. And uh, the reason it's so relevant to us is because you really can say that um, uh, we live our lives on two levels. There's the outer script, script of the outer level of our awareness, the script that we're most familiar with, is the things we go through every day, uh, the obvious things that our senses uh, experience, in our interactions, in the things we initiate, and that we react to. But then there's another script called the hidden script that's beneath the surface that really is uh, the, the forces that truly shape who we are and how we really react. You know, why some of us, for instance, uh, deal with confrontation in a very aggressive way and some of us deal with it in a very passive way. Some of us retreat. Or other situations that we're confronted with or we, are, we have to face, we react differently. And always based on logic and the circumstances of the situation, very often those uh, factors that come into play are things that are playing themselves out on an underlying script beneath the surface, which in English they call the unconscious, but I'll introduce some other words here that are a little more um, explanatory, just to the unconscious just as this one global name that sounds like anything that's not conscious is unconscious uh, and so on. So there's a whole um, there's a whole world beneath the surface of our conscious experiences and and actually the analogy I'm going to give right now is not my own it comes straight from Zohar that um, the unconscious is often compared to the sea, to the world of the sea, water, the world of water. Because just like water when you look at an ocean, you look at the sea cover, when you look at the sea cover, you only see is uh, very little. You see uh, some waves, maybe a fish or two jumping out once in a while, but no clue that what is going on are brimming beneath the surface. If we never went under beneath the surface with, uh, with uh, whether through scuba diving or through uh, cameras and other uh, submersibles of uh, finding out what's going on, we would think that the sea is really a very empty uh, world. As I said, from the surface, you have no clue how complicated and how intricate the life beneath the sea is. Today we know that not only is it as complicated and not only is it as, as alive as what's going on on land, but even more so. The Talmud says, Kol ma yesh yesh Everything that exists on earth, on land, exists in the sea. Except the Talmud distinguishes except one or two one creatures. But that it doesn't say that everything that's in the sea is on land. The sea has many more species than land does. And it's still, as, as close as it is to us, we know less about the seas than we do know about sometimes millions of miles away in outer space. The sea is a very complicated world, and there are still parts of the sea that nobody has ever even come to uncover. And... Um, we know today that the sea has mountains and valleys and volcanoes and earthquakes and uh, much more happening even on land itself. Two-thirds of this earth is covered by the sea. So, yes, we have in a poetic sense there's a certain mystery around oceans and seas. But even on a very uh, basic level, there's, the sea itself, its nature is such that as opposed to land where everything is exposed, everything is submerged in the sea. And therefore the consciousness, you can say, or the unconsciousness of the sea is a whole different dimension. And according to the Kabbalists, um, the sea is the world of the unconscious. It's 
a matter of fact, when we refer to Moses, Moses, the name Moses, I don't know how many of you know this, but Moshe in Hebrew, who gave him that name? That's not the name that, uh, that, uh, that his Jewish parents gave him. Yechever and Amram gave him a different name. Talmud talks about these names. Most of us don't even know that he had another name. The name Moshe comes from a name that the daughter of Pharaoh, the Bible tells the story, that Moses was put into a basket at the edge of the river Nile <coughs> and uh, to, to hide him from the Egyptians because there was the decree. The Egyptian Pharaoh decreed that all male boys or all boys, all males should be killed and thrown to the river Nile. So Yecheved, the mother of uh, Moses, hid him in a basket on the river Nile and the Bible continues. It's not commentary. This is right at the beginning of Exodus. The Bible continues how one day the daughter of Pharaoh went to bathe in the river Nile and she heard the cry of a child. And she saw the basket floating. And she reached out and drew the child out of the water. And hence she called him Moshe. Because in Hebrew, Min Mishisihu. Moshe comes, is like an Egyptian word for drawing out someone from water. Min Mishisihu. As the Torah says this, the Bible says this, and that's why Forever and ever, this, this is his name, which is odd. First of all, where's the respect? His parents gave him the name. Just because she happened to schlep him out of the water, suddenly his name becomes forever the name Moshe. Uh, forget about her yichus and her, uh, her, uh, her um, uh, how do you translate yichus? Uh, uh, no, there's another one. There's a word for it. Her genealogy, huh? I know there's a word. I, I'll, I'll, it'll come to me. I'm sorry. Pedigree. Okay. Um, that you know. But besides that, it seems like an incidental story. Who really cares? I mean, some some detail of a story that Moses happened to be high, hidden in a basket and she drew him out of water. And this should become his name, forever etched in the in the Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu, Torah's Moshe, the great Moses, the great prophet Moshe Rabbeinu. So it's a very obvious question, and the, the Zohar whose author we just honored his uh, yard site on Sunday, Lagbaumer, which is one of the reasons I chose this subject, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi, Rajbi, the author of the Zohar, who, uh, as the Arizal, another great mystic in the, in the 15th century, 16th century, the, uh, Isaac Luria writes or says that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi is a Gilgal, is a reincarnation of Moses, so he writes that Moses, the reason we emphasize the idea of Moses from uh, the, the name Moshe is because it actually captures the essence of the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu. It wasn't an accident that his mother put him on water. It, is very, it has a lot of deep meaning to it. The significance of it is because Moshe's soul comes, as the Zohar explains briefly, and elaborated upon in other books, comes from the world of water. The world of water is the world of the unconscious. Moshe Rabbeinu was a soul. There are the rare souls that come from that world. And, and they come into a conscious world. And the whole purpose of Moses' mission in this world was to bridge the two worlds of land and water. So in the Kabbalistic terminology, the world of land, water is called Alma de Iskasia, called the hidden worlds. And the, wor the world of land is called Alma de Izgaya, the revealed worlds. Or the unconscious and the conscious. And uh, the man Moses came from the water world and therefore the name, hence the name, she drew him out of water. Because the Bible, you see, is really a, a mystical book. It's just written in the language of human beings. So even when you talk about a physical story like that, that someone draws someone out of water, we would just relate it in a very, uh, on the conscious level, it has a very simple meaning. She simply saw a basket with a child and she drew him out of the water. But on an unconscious level, the Torah really is referring to an, a, deeper, uh, a deeper dimension, and that's the dimension of reaching into a more hidden world and revealing it and bringing it to the surface. So the Bible and mysticism are fraught and filled with this concept of bridging these two worlds. And, uh, and this is what we'll be discussing this evening in more depth. And as I said, the reason it's so both fascinating and relevant is because it affects everything we do. You are not what you see. It's not what you see. You see is not what you get. Let's put it that way. You are a end product of many forces at work beneath the surface, most of which we are not aware of. Because, for instance, the earliest experiences in our lives are when we were young children. Or you can even go back before, by, right after conception, 
while we were in our mother's wombs. None of that is in our conscious memories. Maybe some people feel they have some memories from that period, but if they are, at best, it's very sporadic, very uh, incoherent. And uh, we are, but we're not aware of that. The, time, the things that you become aware of are usually at some age, from there on you begin to remember things in more of an organized manner. Even our early childhoods, I don't mean only two or three years old. The first memories most people have is from around three years old. Some two and a half, some two, something traumatic happens, some people can go a little earlier. Again, as I said, it's, it's, very, it's very sporadic. Most of our memories, even in our young childhood, are usually associated, like, not as a flow, but you're connected. Like, you remember, oh, when I was six years old, I was in this class, uh, this was my classmate. You're associated with people, events, special events, and you're connected to that. Because children don't think abstractly, and they also don't think in, um, like, like a, they don't think in terms of a sequence of events. Memories are more uh, like flashes. It's when we get a little older where you can tell a narrative, where your story becomes, your life becomes more of a narrative. Now, is that better or worse? We'll discuss that as well. You know, who's more in touch with reality, children or adults? As, as, uh, as, as counterintuitive as it sounds, we'll soon find out that children are actually more in touch. Because once, you be once you're conscious of things, you actually, in a way, are less in touch with what's going on. Because according to these mystics, psychologically speaking, as soon as you become conscious of something, it means you're no longer one with it. It's you and the thing. It's like a subject and an object. A person who's really in a moment, or like they say in the zone, the subject and object cease to, the, the, the difference between the subject and object melts, and you become the object. For example, when you're really immersed in something that you're really in touch with, or in love with, or uh, completely submerged in, you're not even feeling, I'm experiencing it, because you are it at that point. As soon as you experience something, it means there's you and there's the experience, which means you have not really fully integrated it. True integration, actually, is one that is not conscious at all. So you can even say consciousness is really a form of uh, blindness, or almost a, a going away from your real essence, because essential experiences do not have a do not do not allow for the conscious sense of things. Just to give an example, I often mention it here. Like if someone were to ask you, um, uh, here's 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 a thing like this. We'll give an example. Right now, um, if someone were to ask you, what does health feel like? What does it feel like to breathe? As soon as you're able to describe what it feels like, you need to usually see a doctor. Because health shouldn't feel like anything. Breathing should just be so smooth and so seamless that it shouldn't have a sensation. If you feel something, that means there's something wrong. Health really is just an invisible flow where you don't feel your blood rushing through your veins and you don't, feel any, and you don't have any sensations because the sensation would, would, would dictate that there's something blocking or there's something... Uh, something to feel. Or if I were to ask you now, for example, um, I'm pausing intentionally because the difference between the moment before I ask you and the moment after I ask you, like what is uh, your left leg doing? So before I ask you that question, it's not like your left leg or uh, other part of your body was not doing something, it's just you weren't conscious of it. It didn't make it less real. It didn't make it less alive. Nothing changed. The only thing is you're thinking about it right now. So you're thinking, oh, my left leg, okay, it's, 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 uh, it's crossing my right leg. Or uh, whatever it is, it's touching the floor. You know? So my point is that not, consciousness itself does not dictate or state what something exists or doesn't exist. It's just our relationship with that. It's almost our description of it. So you're already an observer. When you're not conscious of it, it doesn't mean you're not experiencing it. It just means you're not observing it as an outsider. You are it itself. You all right. It's like the difference between a verb and a noun. So is love a verb or a noun? If it's a verb, then there's one person loving another. If it's a noun, it's a state of being. I am, I am love, or I am in love, meaning that love is so integrated with me that it's just who I am. It's not something I'm just doing. Or when you say a person is doing good things or is a good person. So doing good things is a verb. You are doing something good. And a good person is a noun, a state of being that he's always in that state, whether he's actually actually acting on it or not, is a second fa a second is a second secondary to the fact that the person is good no matter when or where, even when it's inconvenient. So, with that being said, the essentially essentially understanding that the forces that work within us are critical because, frankly, everything we do, 
the problems we try to solve, issues we have with relationships, any challenge we have in our lives is all a direct result of unconscious forces. Now, that doesn't mean you can't, so to speak, function on a conscious level without knowing about those forces. You can. People do it all the time. But you can also walk around blindly and uh, basically aimlessly until, God forbid, stri uh, crisis strikes. So we can manage and we can function. I mean, just like somebody who's in pain functions on painkillers. You can get rid of the symptoms even without talking about the roots. But is that really solving the problem or just ignoring it or pushing it away for another time, procrastinating? So understanding ourselves on that level is really, really understanding the fuller sense, who am I and who are you and what are the forces that shape us? And above all, can you access that? And can you actually rewire and uh, reconfigure those inner forces to react, to, to react differently and to uh, behave differently on the outer level. Because after everything is said and done, the unconscious shapes the conscious, not the other way around. And therefore, if you are able to access it, uh, frankly, your life can be completely changed from one extreme to the next. You'd be able to access uh, potential, creativity, other forces that may re be, remain locked and trapped in that place that are not expressing themselves. It, it, may, it can affect how you control your life and how you react to situations, anger management. I mean, the list goes on. I don't think there's an area in life that is not affected by it. I mean, the truth, when we go to therapy or we try to reach the people who are so-called mentors or those that we trust f f see a little more than we see or are more objective than we are, you're really trying to find someone who can help you look a little deeper than you would look on your own so you can do something about it. The question is whether you actually get someone that's competent or not. Another story. But the, 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 the search for it is a result of people either their lives are not working well or there are things they need to correct or there's relationship problems or other stuff going on that you see on the conscious and uh, surface level you can't really fix easily. So you look deeper. You look to dig deeper. The question is, as I said, how successful that is, that's another story. Like they keep saying, that if uh, all these self-help books that talk about the secret of happiness would work, there wouldn't be so many bestsellers. Because if they worked, why do you need another one? You know? So clearly the search continues, or some cynics would like to say that the destination is the search itself. You know, Just by searching, that's as far as you're going to go. You're never going to get anywhere, really. You're just going to keep searching. So there will be all kinds of uh, different uh, offerings, and um, some better than others, helping us in that direction. Um, I'd, I'd like to, well, I already began, but like that speaker that said that before I give my talk, I'd like to give a 20-minute introduction. Um, that's, not what I, that's not what I'm leading to, but there was, a, I think, a good way to visualize what I'm going to be discussing here is this following episode, which has become pretty much legend in our times. I think it was, uh, what was his first name, Albert? Who, Dr. Albert Hoffman. He died last year. He is the, the what can we call it? it's called the inventor of a called, thing called LSD. So he was a uh, he's a pharmacist uh, and a scientist who worked in um, one of the laboratories in Switzerland. And actually, he was looking for and this is in the early 50s. He was looking for a drug to develop a medic a drug that would simulate uh, psychosis what was called then madness. And because he was working with patients that had mental issues, and he wanted to see if he can simulate it, that he, he or other medical professionals can experience it, so in a way they can go into the mind of a person that is in that type of state, which would, of course, make it be a breakthrough because it would allow them to relate to someone, not from an outside in, but inside out. Now, of course, it's quite risky business because... Who knows, you know, you could fall upon something and maybe you can't return either. So he created this whole elaborate system of uh, checks and balances where he was, he, would, he was experimenting with different chemicals um, and mixing them and testing them on himself because nobody's going to subject themselves to his tests of some type, some type of simulated psychosis. And, uh, but knowing fully well the risks, what he did was he set up a tape recorder and a notepad so in case he would be going into any type of altered states, 
he would be able to document it. So even if he would not return, at least it would remain the documents of his uh, research. Now, it's like one of these Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde stories. But it actually happens to be a true story. <clears throat> and, um, and he was experimenting. I don't know how long it took him, but finally one day, and this he writes in his journal, one day he... Um, he, uh, I think he, I think it was the morning, late morning, and he ingested some type of chemical, com, con, what do they call it? A <laughs> concoction is the word I wanted to use, right? Compound is the is the, is the scientific term. Concoction is more appropriate. You know, one of those uh, with the test tubes with all the smoke, smoking test tubes, um, and he ingested it, and then he went home for lunch. And, he, and uh, he was riding, as he, he describes in his journal, he was riding on a bicycle along a beautiful path, which was, uh, which was framed by two sides of hedges, like, you know, like for miles long, beautiful type of scene, scenery. And he was uh, driving on his bicycle, and suddenly he felt uh, some sensation, something changed. And this change began to uh, actually have a really strong impact on him. His blood started rushing. And then he began to visualize things. And again, all this is, he, is documented later by himself, because when he, you'll soon see when he gets home, he recorded it all. And he says, what he describes is that suddenly his bicycle felt like it was lifting off the ground. He knew that he was still wheeling it, but it was like lifting off the ground. The two, the bushes on the side began to like vibrate and, and, the, and turn into all kinds of, uh, looked like flames and colors. And the sky began to like uh, oscillate and, uh, and he had what was called the first psychedelic experience which he did not know at the time and he thought he was going mad he thought he was going completely mad and, uh, and it got worse and worse meaning worse and worse everything like not everything that was supposed to be inanimate became alive and he's saying he's on his bicycle and experiencing this whole type of feeling like the whole universe is breathing and throbbing uh, energy and everything is moving, and there's colors changing, and it was like a whole experience like that. Um, just as a disclaimer, I never took acid, so don't think that I'm describing any trips of my own here. Uh, even though I must say that once in this class, not more than once, but I remember, I don't know if you were there, it was in my home, so I was describing about the energy that exists. I'm just taking a little aside here. I mean, it's relevant, you'll see in a moment. So I was describing they were like oranges and apples. I said that, you know... On the conscious level, they all look like apples, oranges, and objects. But in truth is they're all throbbing with energy, and there's really a force inside all of them, in this orange, and this apple, and these peanuts, and so on, and the table. And uh, it's just that our naked eye cannot see all the energy. And I remember Michelle Liguri was her name. She says, she looked at me, she said, can you say that again? You know, since I thought she thought I was a little crazy. So I said, well, you can't see it, but she says, no, did you say that orange is energy? You actually... Described energy. So can you describe it a little more? So I gave a little more description, a little more graphic description. So she said to me, how much acid did you drop in your life? You know, so I said, I'm sorry, I never did. She said, impossible. No way. There's no one that can describe that, that without having taken LSD. So I said, well, I'm telling you. I said, how are you so sure? She says, well, because I dropped enough to know. <laughs> and she says, it takes one to know one. And she would not, she refused to accept that, uh, that, uh, she told me she was one of the students in Berkeley in the late 50s when it was legal. Because after Hoffman discovered it, it became something that they were experimenting. Students volunteered for experiments. And Berkeley, of course, was uh, a good place for that. So she was one of the students that volunteered. It actually was not illegal until, I think, 1966. Um, so she was one of those students. Well, I wasn't. But uh, what, I, what I found fascinating was I told her, I said, I'll tell you where I got this from. It's not like... And I opened up a Tanya, the second book of Tanya. It's called Shai Yuchad Vamuna, and he talks about the, the throbbing energy within everything that's constantly being renewed. And the, when you read it, it's extremely graphic and very detailed in how every part of existence is really energy. And what we see matter is just an outer level, outer layer. Just like think of your own body. You see a body. So if I was a Martian and I never saw a body before, I see a body, how, do I, how would I know what's inside the body? Like the sea that I mentioned earlier. You see arms and legs, a head. But we all know that a human being is far more complex than just a composite of flesh, bones, skeleton, nerves, uh, blood vessels, and so on and so forth. You know, God knows how many, I mean, how complex, how complicated life is. Like you know, 
What is anxiety like? You know, and all the layers and everything we go through all day. You think to yourself, what are you, how, how much can really be going on in a frame that's not more than, let's say, uh, you know, five, six feet tall, uh, 100, 200 pounds? Uh, you know, how much can be going on inside this little thing here? You know, but the truth is we know, and sometimes not to our, uh, not to our satisfaction how complicated our feelings are and what's going on inside. And we shouldn't be deceived by the fact that the outside box looks so, uh, so, uh, so um, innocent and innocuous. So anyway, going back to the story with Hoffman, um, so he comes home finally after this, this, this psychedelic ride that he took, and he says that he really thought he was going crazy. He did not know if he's ever returning, and he began to jot down, almost like, you know, he didn't even remember, he says when he was writing, he, did, he didn't see an ink. He just saw, saw like life being coming out of his fingers, you know, his fingers became melted into his pen, his pen into the letters, into the paper, and he began to document and put on the tape recorder, documenting his whole experience, which is what he then published of what he experienced. Now, of course, after a few hours, it wore down, and he realized it was not a permanent state, and he began to develop, and this is why I'm telling the story, because it's, it, uh, when I read it for the first time, it so it blew me away, not his experience, it blew me away because when you, I, before I read him, I had read the Eitz Chaim, which is a classic work of Kabbalah, and almost word for word, the experience that he did, his theories are like, are literally straight out of the Jewish mysticism. And this is what he came up with. Uh, because remember, he was trying to develop and find a, medic, a, a drug to simulate psychosis, mad, madness, so he can, uh, he can relate to, in some way, address and understand what people are going through. The truth is, in a, say you can, in a way, you can say he was the first to really, I can't say the first, but one of the first and pioneers to really pioneer what we call today chemical imbalances, that the mind is about chemical imbalances. Words like madness are not really used today. That's just a euphemism. You know? You know, the whole idea of lobotomy, that was once used by doctors, legitimate doctors. They would actually cut out a part of the brain if, if a person was suffering some type of mental thing, because they thought if you cut it out, today we'd look at it as like ludicrous, not only ludicrous, look at it as barbaric. Uh, a lobotomy. But it was a legitimate approach with the knowledge they had about the brain, which was very little. The whole idea of a brain being much more driven by chemicals and by uh, hormones and by other, uh, by synapses and by neurons and so on is completely very, very recent. Because it's not intuitive. You know, you wouldn't think of it that way. You think of a brain, most people thought of a brain just like we think of other things. You know, you have a hand, you have a leg, you have a heart, and you have a brain. To understand a brain in this type of almost uh, energy field is very, very new and, and still mostly uncharted territory. But if you read the Kabbalah and Hasidic thought, it's all about energy. A mind is not about the brain. It's about energy from beginning to end. So here's what he came up with, which, as I said, is just the tip of the iceberg of what's really discussed when you really analyze the unconscious. This is what he said. He came up with this idea that um, that most of us think of sanity as being the way the way to be, right? Most of us would like to be considered sane, right? Not insane. Is that uh, accurate? Should we show show of hands? Um, sanity, however, sanity, as we shall see in a few moments, may be actually a state of uh, blindness. And the way he saw it was like this, that when he experienced what he experienced, he felt his mind expand, which is where you get the mind expanding the mind. You know, feed your mind. And expanding the mind for him was, in a sense, the reason that we, for instance, can function on a daily basis is because we compartmentalize. We compartmentalize all the time. I'll just use my own example. It's not his example. For instance, a person who goes through serious trauma, a real shocking experience, a loss, a death, or any other traumatic uh, experience. So the moment of shock is, is absolutely overwhelming. As time passes, the shock goes away, and the person begins to uh, grieve or in other, in other forms of catharsis that help you heal. The Talmud says that after 12 months, you begin to forget even someone that you love closely. You don't forget them, but you forget the pain, the intense pain and shock and overwhelming trauma that a person feels in the beginning will, will dissipate. So usually we think of it as dissipates because the memory begins to fade. And it's true. It is the correct. It's not, again, you don't forget the person. You don't forget them. I mean, my father's yard site was this week. I don't forget him. But five years later, you don't have the same trauma as I did 
the days after he passed away. But the so so as, as as we as we move on, it's a healthy thing because if you continuously lived with that initial trauma, you couldn't be, you couldn't function. There's no way. Anyone going through any trauma has to be able to leave it to be able to uh, fu- f- function in this world. So the truth is, what's really happening is, it means that you're not living in the moment. You have your me- your memory has has faded. And therefore, you've compartmentalized, and you almost like put away that experience in a certain closet, which you can retrieve, but it's compartmentalized, it's balanced. When a person, for instance, is experiencing in- intense paranoia, paranoid, as in a clinical way, even, or depression, or any other overwhelming emotions that, that uh, completely control your life, and you try to speak to that person and say, the person says, everything is bad in my life. And they give you the whole list of all the depressing things. And they're not necessarily illusions. Some of them are, are absolutely true. And then you say to them, but there are also good things in your life. They can't hear it. What's happening? Their compartments have broken down. They're, un- they're, not, being, they're not compartmentalizing correctly and saying, okay, here are the good things. Here are the bad things. Here's some. A healthy, sane person is able to compartmentalize. So you're able to function. You're able to manage. If those compartments would break down and the pain or some negative things would be so overwhelming, it, it would completely, like, think of it like a, a, a flood, floodgates opening up and basically flooding the rest of your mind. This is what is essentially, what I just described, is a true chemical imbalance. In our brains, our minds, it doesn't work with physical compartments like closets. Instead, it's chemicals. Chemicals create chambers, so to speak, where they create a balance. So even though something very powerful negative may happen, you have a balance. A little time passes, and, uh, and other experiences in your life, you're able to compartmentalize. So now I go back to what Hoffman said. This was not from him. So he said the following. He said that um, that perhaps it was his theory that <coughs> our conscious minds <coughs> are like <coughs> water dripping out of a faucet. So when you have a faucet, let's say, in your sink, and you turn on the faucet. The whole point of the faucet is that it should um, control the flow, right? But you all know, we all know that the water is coming from some larger body of water, a reservoir or a main that enters the pipes into your home. But the main itself is connected, attached to a larger reservoir, wherever that reservoir. You know, New York's reservoir is hundreds of miles away from here, in the Catskills, north of New York City. And those reservoirs are feeding the the mains that get into your home and the faucet, when you turn it on you're basically just allowing a little trickle to flow, what happens if the faucet breaks so one thing could happen is no water comes out the other option is that too much water comes out and the flow is not being controlled so in that context, this was his theory that sanity is basically a very narrow flow of intellectual energy flowing into the conscious mind from a very unconscious place that's like a reservoir of infinite amount of ideas. Should that narrow flow be broken and the floodgates would open, it would completely overwhelm a person. So in that context, madness or insanity is actually a person who's so in touch with a very with a reservoir of water, however, we can't contain it, so it causes a person to go crazy. <coughs> Which explains, I don't think he says this, so I don't recall him saying it, why sometimes we say there's a very thin line between madness and genius. You know? um, like, not all mad people are geniuses, but all geniuses are almost mad. You can say that. Because, because ultimately, what, if someone has a larger flow of intelligence coming into them, it means that their faucet is a little larger. But if it goes a little over, it can turn into something that's uncontrollable and overwhelming. If it's too narrow, obviously the flow is very, very limited. This is essentially his theory. So his idea was that when he took that uh, chemical or other chemicals similar to that, what was happening was he like opened up the faucet and suddenly was able to see a whole other dimension to existence that can drive you mad. Because in this world we need to be able to contain experiences. We can't just enter a place like that. Now that's uh, they say, Atkan Albert Hoffman. <laughs> that's about Hoffman. The, uh, the thing, as I said, that fascinated me was not that the idea itself, because the idea, as I st- said, is very, very 
basic uh, Kabbalah, basically, basic mysticism. As I said earlier about Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, Minamaya Mishisuyu, was drawn out of water. He was drawn out of a collective unconscious into a conscious world. So in this sense, you can think of it this way. Sanity is really limited intelligence, limited awareness. Now, we don't all don't want to go to the other extreme of insanity because then we don't have the containers to control it. The question is, if there is a bridge between the two worlds, can you broaden the channels to the point where more could enter without overwhelming you? And this, in essence, is the real purpose, or you can say the real growth. When a person, when we talk about expanding our spiritual consciousness or heightening our awareness and sensitivity, it's really that. It's helping a person broaden their channels so more can enter. Not to the extent where it overwhelms, because then it can be destructive. So when you hear the story, for example, of the four great men that entered the Pardis, the orchard, the garden. So you had Rabbi Akiva, Ben Azai, Ben Sheishes, Ben Zoyma, rather, and, uh, and Acher, Elisha Ben Avuya. So the Talmud says these four gentlemen went, went into the Pardis. And it says one became mad, one died, one <coughs> became an apostate. And the fourth one, Rabbi Akiva, Nichnas B'Shalom, Yatsu B'Shalom. He entered in peace and came out in peace. Whole, complete. So of course the question is what's going on here. So any time the Torah mentions a description of entering the pardas, the garden, the orchard, it's really a mystical experience. They went into the world of the unconscious. How one does that is another story. But they were able to. They were, they were of that evolved state that they were able to enter that place. But entering is one half of the story. Coming back is another. Not every experience we enter can we return intact. I mean, we could see it in our own lives. Some of us have tasted from the forbidden fruit in different ways, lost our innocence in different ways, and it's not the same. It's not like you can come back and you suddenly say, start from scratch. It's not that way. Once you have experienced certain things, there's no way you can just say, you know, it's, it's, it's just a distant memory. It changes you. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, which is one of the most fascinating and, and mysterious stories in the Torah, what was really going on? What did they eat from the tree of knowledge? First of all, what does it mean to eat from a tree of knowledge? They to know good and evil, as the serpent told them. And then God says that once you eat from it, you no longer can live forever. So clearly there's something going on here that's on a deeper level, and I'm not going to go into detail. But basically what happened was, and this is the way the Arizal explains it, is they became conscious of good and evil. They knew of it before as well. But you see, it's called Eitz Hadas, Tree of Knowledge. In, in Torah, there's also Chochmah, Bina, Das. It's not called Eitzah Chochmah. It's not called Eitzah Bina. It's called Eitzah Das. Because Chochmah and Bina are two cognitive skills that we use to understand things. But you still not become part of you. Das, as the Torah uses Das also for the word intimacy. Sexuality is also called Das in the Torah. Why is it called Das? Because intimate knowledge, knowing someone intimately, is not just detached knowledge. It's experiential knowledge. You've become now one with it. As I mentioned, it's not just, you, not just you are a verb, it's a noun. So what happened when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, they no longer uh, just knew about it philosophically. They now tasted from real evil, real evil. They actually experienced it. And once they did that, everything changed. You could almost say it's the birth of consciousness. Before that, they were not conscious of it. Think of, that's why the Torah, the first thing the Torah describes, what happens after the tree of knowledge. So it says, um, uh, what's the expression? It says that uh, they suddenly felt that they were naked and they covered themselves. What does one thing have to do with the next? They didn't know they were naked earlier. But they were suddenly, what happened? They became suddenly so wise. What, was, what happened? Well, what happened before was they were like children. Children are also born naked. But they're not conscious of it. They're not ashamed of it because there's nothing to be ashamed of. Sexuality is very much part of who we are. Animals are not ashamed of their nakedness and neither are newborn children. When does one become ashamed of something? When you become conscious of it and conscious that you could also misuse it or abuse it. Then suddenly you're aware of it. Once you're aware, it's a whole other story. 
So before the tree of knowledge, Adam and Eve knew very well that they were naked, but there was nothing wrong with being naked. They didn't sense their sexuality and their sexual energy as something outside of the divine or outside of something that is healthy and holy and sacred. No different than they saw their arms and their legs or other parts of their body. But once they tasted from something, they suddenly, I'm me, God is here, I experience God, it's no longer you're one with the divine, and once you're conscious of yourself in that way, then you become ashamed. You know, when you're alone in a room with no one else, you're not conscious of it. When you're with others, you're only conscious because there's an object and a subject. There's what we call um, a world of uh, plurality, a duality. That's what the tree of knowledge created, duality. There was no duality before that. It was oneness. And when there's oneness and unity, everything has its place. Consciousness itself, as I said earlier, is a form of blindness, and it's a form of being outside of the reality of something. When you're in, real, in, in something completely, you don't experience it, you are it. For instance, so when you ask the question, are, um, the, can fish get wet? Uh, that's be even better. Can water get wet? Water doesn't get wet. It is wetness. Dry things get wet. Water doesn't get wet. So when someone says, I know so a certain truth, as soon as you say, I know the truth, you're saying there's a me, a self, that's conscious of something else. But once it becomes so much part of you, you don't say, I know it. It's just a reality. It's just what it is. When you, for instance, are listening to a beautiful composition of music, and you completely allow yourself to surrender and to be surrounded by its power, to the point that you don't even feel who you are at the moment, because the music completely submerges you, no different like being underwater. You don't feel, oh, I'm listening to music. As soon as you stop and say, I'm listening to music, you've, you're taking yourself out of that moment. All true moments have that type of integration, a type of seamlessness, where the object and the subject melt into one. True love is like that. Any type of true, real experience is that way. Because the idea of unity, when we say Hashem Echad, it's not just that there's one God and not many gods. It's that there's one reality and not many realities. And that's a rare experience for most of us because we live in a plural, pluralistic universe and we are pluralistic creatures who are, excuse me, going through constantly, we're all about ob object and subject. I'm me, you're you. And me, we may like each other. We may make a deal to work together. But I'm not you and you're not me. When you think in terms of the true uh, field of energy that is beneath the surface, that's not correct at all. There is a certain in intrinsic unity that connects everything. Now, some of you familiar with Far Eastern philosophies will know this is common, this is common truths, common axioms in anything that is, uh, that is not Western. Western thought does not think like this. Western philosophy is very pluralistic and very structured. Eastern thinking is all about this internal unity. You know, I don't know if, I think I mentioned it here in the TED, the, one of the TED lectures, the TED conference lectures. Who was it, the doctor, who was it that spoke about the left brain, the right brain had the stroke, um, what was her name? You've heard that, uh, any of you heard that lecture? So it, it, briefly, you could, I could send you a link if you like. I think I wrote about it once. Um, it's a woman who became a neurologist, a, actually a, what is it called, psychoneurologist, um, and because her brother had uh, some mental illness, schizophrenia, so that's what drove her to that type of work. And then, ironically, she herself suffered a stroke. Um, and uh, the stroke, the stroke, you know, that affected her, uh, which part of her brain affected her, uh, her, uh, her uh, left brain, right? And because she was a psycho uh, neurologist, she was able to understand what was going on. And she describes, you have to hear this this lecture. It's a completely non, not not in any way religious or spiritual context. But she basically says that most of us, you know, we live, our right brain and left brain are constantly interacting with each other. But the right brain thinks uh, in terms of uni a unified way of looking at things. The left brain is the brain that breaks things down. Is it the other way around? I always confuse the two. Huh? Yeah. I'm right or I'm left? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> My right side is your left side. Right? That's how it goes. Uh, um, and, and it's the left brain. Uh, uh, which way did I just say it? I forgot it right. Yeah, the left brain it breaks everything into details. Now I have to brush my teeth. Now I have to get dressed, and so on. And she describes that because the stroke affected her left brain, 
um, she only was able to experience everything as a field of energy. She's, she's seeing herself and experiencing herself in any detailed or breakdown type of fashion. You've got to hear this lecture. It's fascinating. Because, again, it parallels the same idea. So we are so accustomed to a world of details that even what I'm saying now, I see some of your faces like you think, you don't know if I'm going off my mind or not. Um, I assure you that I'm already off my mind, so I have nowhere to go. But just in case you're wondering, because we are so accustomed in the world of our senses and the world of emotions to, um, to, uh, to see things in very compartmentalized ways, it's very hard for us to think in terms of unified. For us, it's like a whole big thing. Oh, I had a unified experience. I had an integrated experience. It's not something that comes easily or is common to us. But in truth, on the unconscious level, everything works in a completely different fashion and form. If any of you have ever read, uh, for example, a book like The Tao of Physics, uh, ever heard of the book? So, so uh, Fridjof Capra, who changed his name, he was a Harvard physicist, and then he went and dabbled into Eastern philosophies, and he wrote this book, it's a very interesting book, where he parallels quantum mechanics with this type of thinking. So, just to show you that this is not completely crazy, for those of us in the Western world, or in the, in the left brain, the fact of the matter is, is this table a table, or is it a field of energy? So most of us would call it a table, and we don't, you know, someone sustain its energy, something either you say it's for the mystics, or it's for the, today, the physicists. A hundred years ago, if someone said this was energy, they, you'd think either the guy's crazy or too religious. Today, if you ask any person, even a lay person who knows a little science, will tell you, this table's not a table, it's, a, it's completely a field of energy. It just takes on the shape to our naked eye that looks like a table. You, for example, colors. We're all so fascinated by colors. But we all know today that colors are really distorted light. Light is truly white. The fact there's a color is because light is being bent by a prism. That's why if you take a crystal, you see that, or a rainbow. That doesn't mean the colors aren't real. They're real to our eye. But just because your eye sees color doesn't mean there's real color there. It means the light is being bent in a way that appears like a color, and so on. So we definitely judge books by their cover, despite the cliché. And we definitely are consumed with the surface level of things. But it's our minds that come to teach us that there's more going on that meets the eye. The question, how much more? And maybe a better question, where is it, what's true reality? That which you see and experience, or that which is going on beneath the surface? It's very hard, once you become accustomed to living on the surface level, to suddenly change your whole perspective and say, you know something? The surface is very, very uh, superficial. You know, maybe when we're trying to be in intellectual mode, we'll say that. But to live like that is not a simple thing because we are creatures of surface creatures. That's how it is. We are land creatures. It doesn't come natural to most people to think in terms of what's inside. Children, by the way, naturally think of what's inside. That's why you see children take something, they always take it apart. Because they're always looking, they always recognize instinctively there's something, not, something going on here. We too have that natural inclination. You want to like take the clock apart and see what makes it tick. But we also have another side. As we become adults, just like our arteries harden, our perspectives harden, and we become very much creatures of habit and creatures that we're accustomed to this world. We don't want to be shaken up and told that there's a whole world underneath us and within us. The only time we, hear, we, 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 only time we really go there is when we have a problem. But if you're comfortable, why, why go there? If you're comfortable on your surface level, why go deeper? So I can't speak for everybody sitting in this room, but I will say if you're a cross-section of, of society, a good sampling of it, some of the people here absolutely identify with the inner all the time and immediately gravitate to things I'm saying about that inside. That's reality. And even though we do live on an outer level, it's, it's very easy and natural for us to relate to that inner. Some here will think that this is completely like, you know, some weird stuff. Um, and at best, it's a little intriguing. And, uh, but more or less, it's not like how you live your life. You know, tomorrow starts another work day. I have to pay my bills. I have negotiations to do. I have no time for this... Uh, unconscious mumbo-jumbo type of thing. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands which category you fit in. I would say if you're coming here to this class, you probably lean more to the first because you wouldn't be coming here because I usually speak about these things. Um, 
But those who are here for the first time, maybe. We'll see if you return. So we'll know. Um, so I usually don't like to go into this... Uh, into this um, I, I, I'm, I'm talking a little more openly than I usually do because for precisely this reason. Because if you go too deep into this unconscious stuff, people think you're something the matter with them. You know? Not that I have a problem with my reputation or you know, I, I don't really care, but, but if you want to get your message across, it wouldn't be good if people think that the one that's teaching it is a little crazy. Right, Yankel, what did you think? What would you think? Yeah. So a little crazy, yeah, but not too, right, type of thing. Um, so what's your impression? Is the jury still out? Okay, okay. <laughs> we will go over the deep end quite soon. Okay, so you'll have time to escape. Um, <laughs> It's a joke. Michelle, please. Uh... <laughs> um... <clears throat> At midnight, some of us do turn into werewolves, just to uh, be forewarned. Um... So, so when it comes to a day like Lag Bomer that I mentioned earlier, it says that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, this great sage and mystic, <coughs> what he actually did, his great contribution, was bridging the unconscious and the conscious. <coughs> but in a way that does not destroy one or the other, in a way that can help us open those channels. The reason this is complicated, as I said, is because each of us is in a different space. Some of us are more accustomed to this uh, language. Uh, some of us have containers that can contain more. Some of us have containers that contain less. So what I'll be saying, hopefully, is uh, generic enough that everybody can apply in their own particular way. But as I said earlier, just like this table today we know is made up of um, elements that in turn are made up of molecules, that in turn are made up of atoms, that in turn are made up of subatomic particles, and, the li and, and it goes deeper and deeper, Science has only reached to that point. So to us, when you look at somebody, we're made up of forces that shape what you see on the outside. So as an example I often give, when a person cries and tears come out of the eye. So you wouldn't say that first you cry, then you feel sad. You say first there's a sadness inside of us, and that sadness then expresses itself for some reason in a tear drop. It, wells up tears in our tear ducts, and then actual liquid, salty liquid comes out of your eye. And the same thing with other body language. You feel a certain uh, joy inside. You see someone you like. You smile to them. The smile, all it is is a physical expression of a feeling that doesn't have a physical manifestation. So when you look from the outside in, you see the physical expressions, the tear, the smile, other expressions. But when you think about it, you know this is just a, uh, it's like a container that's carrying something deeper inside of us. When you really get to know somebody, what you're really getting to know is not just you know their body and their body language, you know their, you can sense their feelings. Either because they communicate them or because you identify or you empathize and you become connected. So when you meet somebody, so the face they have is just a calling card, like their business card. So you know their face, you recognize the person, but when you speak to them, someone you really know, you're speaking not just to a body, you're speaking to a personality. You're speaking to someone who has a whole series of experiences. When you really get to know someone really well, you've got, you're going to deeper layers within. Truly good friends have that type of connection. So it's a soul type of connection that is deeper than just what we capture with an eye, with a naked eye. But again, as I said, the outer layer is so powerful and even when we talk about this inner, these inner forces, we have to like almost continuously re, re, remind ourselves that they're, they're, that they're there. It's so easy to go back to the superficial. How often, for example, do you have a situation someone annoying comes over to you and says something or behaves in a certain way, you immediately dismiss it, and you don't give it too much thought. And then if you really get, but you step back and you do think about it, you say, you know something, who knows what that person is going through? Who knows what brought them to that place? I'm not trying to give an excuse for someone to be obnoxious, but the point is, how would you like others to see you? Sometimes you're in a bad mood or something going on, and people dismiss it or just don't want to be around you, when in truth you may be hurting. You just don't know how to express it. 
just want to qualify again. I'm not justifying we're all adults and we are responsible for our behavior. But the way Hasidim like to say is, always look at another person with the right eye and with yourself at the left eye. Meaning, when you look at someone else, never know, you never know what's causing them to be that way. And it could be something that, if you knew, you would never in your mind believe, is, is say what you said. And with yourself, you have to always be a little harsher than you would with, with another. This is called sensitive people who understand and realize that the forces behind every action is always deeper than what you see. So no matter how a person behaves, you realize there's always something else going on. And those that are really in touch with that is because they're in touch with it usually within, inside themselves, so it's easier to be sensitive to others. You know, you, um, I'll use an example because it just came to mind. You mentioned photography, right? So I know a photographer who was from Russia, very interesting guy. His name was Friedrich, like a real artist. When I met him, he was, um, he was involved in a lot of... Uh, he was, his specialty was, uh, what do you call it, the motion art meaning taking pictures of uh, like ice skaters, ba ballerine, ba ballet, uh, art, uh, sports, it's cap capturing high speed. And he told me once something very interesting. I mean, Picasso was the one that said that, uh, uh, that all art is a lie that reveals a deeper truth. Because art is just is not a reality. You know, it's maybe copying reality, not a real... Reality is constantly moving. A piece of art is, is stationary. Yet, a great artist will capture a scene or capture a face or capture a, 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 mo a mood in a way that you can see a deeper reality, even though the painting itself is not real in the real sense of the word. I mean, it's real as a tangible canvas and ink, but it's not real as a human being. But it can tell you more about a human being than the human being himself or herself is. So he remember, I remember him telling me once about... As he, he said to me, there are people I photograph who have the face of death that's really the way he put it. And he says, those that have the face of life. So I asked him to explain. Because, you know, face is a face. You take a picture of a face and that's it. If you're a good photographer, you'll capture the face. He said, no. Life itself, and a face included, he says, always moving. The whole nature of life, life force, is movement. Death is stationary. He says, there are people who their faces have become so plastic. And so, uh, like almost like a statue. Statuesque that when you capture it, you always see they always look alike. Since the people that are most vibrant and most full of zest and full of energy and vitality, their face is never the same in two photographs. He says maybe an amateur photographer will capture the same picture. But he says if you're really capturing a face of somebody, you will always see a difference in people who have that vitality. I asked him for some examples. I don't want to repeat them. So he gave me an example of a face of death and a face of life. Actually, the face of life he gave me was uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He says, I took many pictures of him, and never is it the same way, because his eyes are always changing, his face, even the complexion, because he's a person who's constantly in touch with life. So he's not like, uh, you know, he's created already that mask that he wears for situations. He's truly natural. And the second, of course, example he gave me was children. He says, you, young, young children, before they get jaded, and before they sort of speak, uh, start, start reacting and making faces to what they, they think people expect or don't expect. In other words, they're no longer responding naturally. He says that's when they start losing that natural face that's constantly alive, a new twinkle, a new excitement, a new joy. He says, so, you know, it was an interesting take from a person who was a stationary photographer. He was taking photographs, and a photograph is a stationary state. It's not movement. It's not like a film where you see a movement of pictures of a, of a sequence of, uh, of frames. It's one frame, but that one frame can capture life, and it looks like a live, even though it's just a picture on the wall. So I'm sure you're aspiring to that type of uh, experience. So the point is that there is a, uh, there's a dimension that is beneath the surface, and uh, the way some of the, you can say the mystics put it, is that it's a natural state of joy. It's a natural state of dancing. You know, with the Baal Shem Tov, the great Hasidic, the founder of the Hasidic movement, whose yard site we honor, 250th yard site, the Shavuos. He, one of the things he reintroduced, not, was well, not new because the Torah talks about it all, the play, all over, is joy. Ivdu Sashem, to celebrate, to serve with joy, to live with joy. And on a very 
uh, juvenile level joy, what does that mean? Do you just dance around? No, joy is an inner state of being where you are constantly know that you are needed and therefore you always celebrate. Sometimes the celebration expresses itself in real dance and song. And sometimes the dance and song is inside your heart. You're dancing and singing all the time. Real Hasidim always danced and sang. Obviously, they knew where to do it uh, in public and when not to. Those that don't, that's where there's, as I said before, with the unconscious and conscious, you have to also have the balance. But, but internally, there's always a constant line. Someone just mentioned to me today, and I, the first time I ever heard this, I said I'll use it. Um, it, it it's, there are two muscles in your face that are required to smile, but seven are required to uh, scorn. Did you know that? You need to use seven muscles to scorn, to give a sour face, and only two to smile. I guess God created us to be more natural smilers than uh, sour. Try it out. You know, look in the mirror tonight and see how many... Uh, right. You want, to, you want to do a demonstration? Huh? Yeah. And also, uh, it also explains another thing. You know, as you get older and the wrinkles begin to settle in, I mean, uh, regard, we're not talking about... Uh, Non-Botox related here. Um... Uh, you'll see that uh, people who scorned a lot in their faces, in their, in their lives, that you know, their faces begin to get shaped in that direction. So remember, things last. And those that smile a lot, that also begins to get etched in the stone. So yes, we know the story of the portrait of Dorian Gray, um, but not all of us are so lucky or so cursed, you can say, uh, that you can just uh, transfer your whole uh, being to the portrait. Uh, if you don't know the story, it's fine, too. It's from our great Oscar Wilde. <laughs> So, to go back to this unconscious, so the question then is um, how, as we stand right now, each of us in our own lives, how can you broaden these channels? We don't like to feel that we can in some way access and actualize more of our potential. Everybody has potential. The good news is your potential is always greater than your actual. That's the good news. The bad news is, well, I don't know if the bad news, the other side of the story is, what's the proportion, the ratio? So you always have more potential than you think you have, and you definitely have more potential than you're actualizing. The question is, how do you actualize potential? How do you so-called draw out from the reservoir of your potential skills and powers into your conscious life? And this is true especially for people who are creative, to uh, generate more creative juices, um, broadening the channels. And this is also true with whatever st struggles or every challenges each of us have, it comes down to this. You can try to attempt, you can attempt to remedy it by a certain type of short-term, like a uh, Band-Aid, or you can dig deeper and look inside and see those, see those roots. You know, much of our attitudes today are, as I said earlier, a result of our reactions in our homes. Some of us are running away from our homes, and some of us are running too, too close to our homes. In other words, some of us are still extensions of our parents, and some of us are trying to sever the extension. Is there some in-between place where you can become yourself, that you don't have to be running away, which is equally being haunted by them, as those that don't know how to run and don't know how to cut the umbilical cord. And it's all connected to a person as they get older and mature. Can you uncover who you are? What is your unconscious like? And what has shaped your behavior. So as long as you remain stuck on the conscious surface level, you will be trapped by your habits. There's no way around it. The only way to break a habit in any serious way is to go to a place that's deeper than the habit. Like in a sense, the wiring that precedes the habit and rewire it. And it's absolutely possible and doable. And I've seen it happen many times. Sometimes, unfortunately, but this is reality, it often happens when the conscious and the surface level is not working. So you have no choice but to go rewire. You know, when things fall apart, when you hit rock bottom, when uh, you become so uh, desperate, when you become addicted to something that you see is destroying your life, whatever it is, physical, psychological, spiritual, whatever it may be, religious, some addiction that controls your life, when you begin to realize it's destroying you, it forces you to have to go deeper. It's, usually, it's harder often to go there if you don't have something that compels you to. Because as I said, comfort zone is a very powerful place to be. If it's working on the surface level. Why should I rock the boat? I mentioned last week. Even if it's something that's not so healthy, 
the known evil is always easier than the unknown evil. When I start digging up, who knows what I'm going to find? That type of approach. So this, again, is something that's very individualistic. There's no j rule. But I could say, no matter who you are, going deeper into your soul can only be a benefit. Because I obviously come from a school of thought that the bigger you're deep in your soul, the more, the more beautiful it gets. You know, some of us may be brought up that the, digger you, the, de the deeper you dig, the uglier it gets. So if you believe it gets more beautiful as you go deeper, then what's there to be afraid of? It may be unknown, but you're going to find things that, you will, that, will, um, that will amaze you, that will transform you. So it's really about how you turn a mediocre life into a magical one. Uh, how do you, a life that's of despondency or uh, even depression into some type of joy? Because there's no question there are reservoirs of joy inside every person's soul. There's no such thing as a child that's born sad. Yes, we have genes, and sometimes there are maybe despondent genes, but you'll not find a sad child. Unless there's some, God forbid, some, some deficiency or something, a naturally born child will be naturally happy. That means the natural state of a human being is happiness. It's only when we start seeing disappointment <coughs> and pain that we begin to cover up, that happiness gets covered up. So if you go with that firm conviction, and you know, like there was a custom in the olden days, there were armies, when they went out to march to war, they would sing a song of victory. They didn't even begin fighting. What are you singing? You know, why are being so cocky? Because if you don't believe that you can win the war, you're never going to win it. Because the war is difficult. So it's about confidence. If you know, before you even embark on the journey, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, you will fight differently. If you don't know there's a light at the end of the tunnel and you have doubts, you begin questioning yourself. And then things are usually lost. One of the biggest lessons in Vietnam War was that the American people and the soldiers had no clue, first of all, you can win, that whether we can win, and second of all, what we're fighting for. I'm not even getting into whether it's a just war or not a just war, but there's one thing is for sure. If you don't know what you're fighting for, you don't know you can win. And the light at the end of the tunnel, as people like to say, is not the lights of the oncoming train. It means that there's like a real light to get out. So in that sense, having that confidence is critical. So how does one actually broaden channels? So here's a few, uh, I don't want to use the word gimmicks, a few methods, techniques. Uh, one of them, maybe the biggest one of all, is a theme I've, I've discussed many times here. It's called uh, bitl, bitl. So bitl in Hebrew, it's a Hebrew word. It means a suspension of your present or previous perspectives, which allow in another way of looking at things. So if you're convinced that this table is a table, and that's where you're trapped, there's only one way for you to... May open yourself up to another perspective is by saying, well, let me hold on before I come to any conclusions. Let me think, let me hear another alternative way of looking at this table. And I'll, I'll, I'll spell it out even more uh, graphically in a, in a personal relationship context. Someone you love, let's say you're, or someone you're dating or you're looking to see if you could have a serious relationship. And something happens, some crisis, some, uh, some challenge. You may think it's a form of betrayal. The other person did something, said something, and you, you begin to distrust them. Okay, so if you're an intelligent person, you don't draw a conclusion quickly because you may be wrong. You don't want to just blow the whole thing out of your fears or paranoia because you may have been hurt in the past. So if, just to think of two ways, two uh, scripts, how this can evolve. If you allow yourself to feed into all the fears, you begin seeing patterns and say, okay, now, where was that person yesterday? And we could go and you start, start seeing a whole conspiracy building. Whether it's true or not doesn't make a difference. But you have now written a script. that now the other person and anyone trying to undo it has very difficulty because you've already written a, a, a you know, it's like, it's, it's not, you're not going to say it's 100%, but it's pretty clear in your mind. Bittal is the attitude, not that you're naive or stupid, but you don't allow yourself to get in the way and your fears and you're allowed, at least allowed to, to see whether there are other possibilities. Maybe you're completely wrong. You'll see in arguments or in discussions two types of people. And I'm specifically talking now about intelligent people. If you have an argument with not such an intelligent person, 
okay, you can forgive them because if their level of intelligence is not that high, they may argue in, in ridiculously or, or, or endlessly. But think about two intelligent people in a, in a conversation and even a debate. You'll find two things happen, two options. Either the debate gets, begins to rage and gets greater and greater and greater and with no resolution. Because they're so, both so brilliant, they each have great arguments. And it gets so abstract, you can't even know who's what. You know? and, 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 and smart people know how to rebut and how to find counter-arguments, blah, blah, blah. Or you find, actually, where one person listens and actually changes his mind. <clears throat> or even sometimes even better, where two people listen, they both change their mind, then they start debating the other way around. They both change their mind. That's when it's, that, I don't mean to that extent, but okay. Now, what's the difference between these two? So you think the, 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 the people who continuously argue, say they'll, they'll say the difference is because I knew I was absolutely right. In that other case, the guy wasn't right, so he changed his mind. See, that's the arrogant answer. The difference really is, one was humble and actually has secure enough to be able to hear a position that's different than his or hers. So being intelligent is one thing. Being secure is another. Not every intelligent person is secure. Not every brilliant person is, is confident. Sometimes it looks that way because you think a smart guy or a smart woman you know, they're so smart, they should be confident, but they're not necessary because confidence and secure comes from emotions and the brilliance comes from the brain. I would even tell you that a lot of smart people hide their insecurity with their intelligence. And they're very, very insecure. Where do you see the difference? You see a person who's able to hear an argument, able to state a position, an intelligent position, then someone gives them another position and they honestly have the ability to listen to a completely different position even though they're invested and they may even have self-interest in their own position and listen to it and change their mind. That's bitter. That's where you open up the channels to the unconscious because you, you are no longer in the way. The first person doesn't allow themselves, so they may be brilliant, but they're only brilliant as the conscious mind can allow you to be. They don't allow you to go deeper into the subject matter. And I'll give you an example that's used in... Um, in, uh, in some Hasidic texts. I, and I've written about it. So if any of you want some written documentation about this, I can send you. If you send me an email about it, I'll, I'll send you the written stuff. It's a very fascinating discourse where he explains the difference between the first tablets and the second. So Moses rose up on the mountain and receives two tablets at Mount Torah coming up soon, uh, two weeks, Shavuos. And, however, 39 days later, he comes back down. He sees the Jews had built a golden calf. He breaks the tablets, only to go back up on the mountain and come back 180 days later on Yom Kippur with a second set of tablets. That's the story in, in a nutshell. And Yom Kippur, he comes down with a second set of tablets. So there's fascinating discussions about the difference between these two tablets. So in most cases, you think the first tablets are much greater and superior to the second than they are, the first were carved by God, in, engraved by God. The second, it says, the tablets themselves were shaped by God, but the letters were engraved by Moses. Or is it the other way around? And it says in the Medrash like this. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact language. It says in the Medrash on the, on the verse, the verse goes like this. That I've given you Taluma is Chachma, the secrets of wisdom, Taluma is like the hidden dimensions of wisdom, Kaflaim the Tashia, twice as much, or twice as strong. And the Medrash says this is the second tablets, because the first tablets did not have the secret wisdom, they had wisdom. So he explains in this discourse the difference between conscious and unconscious thinking. And he uses an example. He uses an example of um, uh, the sparks that come out of a flint stone and a coal that is a hot coal. So a coal that's a hot coal, even though you may not see the heat immediately, but if you blow on it, it's right there. It's obvious. When you look at a stone, a flint stone, 
Even if you blow on the flintstone or you uh, fan it, you don't see anything. But when you strike it hard, it releases sparks. So he says the difference between the conscious and unconscious is the following. The conscious mind, so the intelligence is always there, even though maybe beneath the surface, but like a coal, a hot coal, if you fan it, if you blow on it, it suddenly you suddenly see the flames. The unconscious has hidden sparks, talumas chachma, the hidden wisdom, unconscious wisdom, and the only way to get there is by striking it very hard. So he explains that the difference between the first tablets and the second tablets is like the difference between the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. In the Jerusalem Talmud, the ideas are presented in a very direct fashion. In the Babylonian Talmud, everything is an argument. Someone says a statement, another one says a counter-argument, then a counter-argument, a counter-argument. You can't imagine how many levels of argument. That's where Jews, that's where if you talk about why Jews argue so much, it's all Talmudic. The problem is it then spilled over to stupid petty arguments. There it was at least about uh, profound subject matters. So the question is, which is the, where do you get more wisdom? If someone just gives you a brilliant piece of information, or if there are arguments back and forth, back and forth, questions, counter-questions. So he explains, the arguments themselves is like hitting the rock. It's a real argument. You're, you're basically stretching an idea. A person says something, the other one argues with them. What you're really doing is like trying to dig deeper and find the kernel, the crystal clear idea that can only come through, as he puts it, kashis pirukim, which are questions and counter-questions and, and debates and counter-arguments. So to reach that place requires like hitting, the striking the stone. And that doesn't come easily because you have to break the surface to access the unconscious wisdom. And that's what the second tablets did. first tablets were given from heaven in a very beautiful way. It's only after they built the golden calf and now they needed to dig deeper because they were not going to get reconciliation with God this time easy. They built a golden, they built, it was idolatry. Now they had to dig deeper and this requires questions and darkness. So even though it's dark, but it's the darkness that leads you to a greater light that light itself can never lead you to. So the first, the two methods that come out of this in our lives is number one is you need what's called yagiya. Strain, strenuous effort. And the smarter you are, the more effort you need. So there's a thing called yagiya samayach, to actually concentrate on something where you actually feel like you're breaking through barriers. You ever try to understand something you don't initially understand, Many of us give up. We say, you know what? I don't understand. Let somebody else understand. I'll be Yates over there understanding, you know, type of thing. <laughs> but, but if you really want to break through, sometimes you have to really strain yourself. That strain is very much part of the process. It's very similar to how a seed has to rot in the ground before it, bears, before it grows into a sapling. Or how a mother has to go through pain before giving birth to a child. All great achievements are going to come through a a type of strenuous or uh, you could say um, challenging situation because you have to break the previous shell. You cannot assume a new layer of skin if the previous layer was not, was not, is not shed. It's the rule of all growth. So, so, so number one is bittel, the ability to get out of your way of looking at it. As soon as you do that, you've opened up a channel to another place which is the unconscious, and it will respond. If there's no bittel, your, 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 your door is sealed. It's like a full cup. You're already full. There's no room for anything else, so you're not going to open up new channels. You can't have your cake and eat it too, as they say. You have to open yourself up to another perspective if you want something to come in. If you're convinced that you're, everything is going well, then why should any new potential suddenly come and actualize in your life? You have to be ready and have that type of humility to say, there are, there's a level of potential that I have not yet accessed. And I'm not there yet. As soon as you say that, and you really feel that, you've opened yourself up to it. The only thing that's easy, that, that's easy at all, that's one of the hardest things to do. That's why I said earlier, sometimes it has to be forced on a person through not comfortable circumstances. The second that I just said is yigiyah, is the, stre the, st the strain, the strenuous effort. There's something beautiful to be said about a person struggling to understand the concept. Not that it comes easy, specifically struggling. The struggle is itself what breaks the stone and releases sparks. Get rid of the struggle, you'll get maybe some flames, but it won't be from the, in, the, deeper, the deepest parts of the stone.
because you can't access it. You have to drill, and drilling is, stren is strenuous. It's, it takes a lot of exertion. So that's the second, second way that you enter into the unconscious. And the third way, which really is more on a personal level, and really an extension of number one, but you could also say number two, now that I think of it, it's called love. Love is both a combination of bittle and strain. <laughs> I didn't want to put it that way, quite that way. I just remember when I was speaking, went to speak somewhere, and the, the, the event the program manager asked me, so what are the two main favorite topics everyone likes to hear about as you travel around? So I said, number one is relationships, hands down. Love, relationships, uh, sexuality, intimacy, and so on. And number two is always pain and suffering. So I never forget the program manager says to me on the phone, those aren't two subjects, it's the same subject, you know. So I guess um, love, love means, and it's another theme of the Baal Shem Tov, love, Ahavta, Lerecha Kamaycha, Rabbi Akiva said it's a Klal Gadol, meaning a fundamental principle. The ability to love another person comes from, really comes from Bittal. Even though many of us feel that love is just, I'm getting my needs met, so I love somebody, but true love to another is really transcending your needs and yourself and allowing another person into your life and being there for them even when it's not so convenient. If it's a love that's based completely on that type of contractual agreement that I only love you as much, in direct proportion of how much I get from you, that's not love. That's an extension of yourself. It's not true love. It can look like love for a while and can uh, behave like love, but it's not love. Love is tested when it's not so comfortable. Not that anybody should be uncomfortable. But why is love tested? Because that's when you see the best coming out of a person. If it's, it's only when it's on your terms. Like a guy told me, I love her unconditionally as long as she does what I want her to do. You know? um, as, long as, as long as it's on your terms, you've not pierced the stone. You've not uh, expanded your consciousness. It's you. You just found another person to be an extension of you. The guy goes on a date, speaks an hour about himself. And then he tells the girl, he says, okay, enough about me. Now what do you think about me? You know, so the first half of the date was about him, about himself. The second half of the date is her opinion about him. So it may sound like now he cares about what she thinks, but it's about what he wants, you know, what she thinks about him. So basically, him in two different shapes. Uh, so there's, uh, as I said before, with the intelligent people, listening to another person means going out of yourself, and that's how you become wiser. Uh, some people need others only to, to demonstrate how smart they are. They say, so did you get what I said? You know? And they, they, they'll give you the room to, to, to pontificate about ideas as long as it substantiates their ideas. Instead of truly being an experience where I really care and interested in what you have to say and actually nothing to do with what I had to say. And I remember one of the most, uh, maybe, maybe the most profound experiences in my life that shaped, definitely shaped and changed me. I don't even know who I would be today without it. With the years where I spent listening to the Rebbe speak and had to actually retain and absorb his ideas, not my own. And you think, so, you know, what's so good about that? Maybe you should have spent your time thinking about your own ideas. Because it forced me to go to such a difficult, strenuous experience. It's hard enough to write down your own ideas or even develop your own ideas. Imagine having to go into and listening to another person speak and completely um, suspend your own opinions and just repeating what that person had to say. Now, of course, this was an intelligent person and a scholar and a sage and a tzaddik. So obviously there was an incentive. I wouldn't do this for everybody, let's put it that way. You know, that's so. But, but it, it comes down to a certain type of, um, I don't want to use the word surrender. It's a type of suspension of yourself to, to hear another person's ideas. And it changes you because it, forces, it, it really teaches you how to listen. It's an art to listen. Listen doesn't mean that you just hear another person say something. Listen means that you are not letting your mind work and process while that person is speaking. Use that definition for listening and tell me how many people you know that can listen. Now, I don't think necessarily that I'm not, I, I was born the best listener, but in this case, because I did that, it trained me to, to... I know what listening is. I know the standard. Trust me, there are many people tell you I don't know how to listen because I don't listen to them. But um, the idea is, however, but I know what it takes to listen. Takes to listen is not just uh, having open ears. It's un literally able to shut down your processing wheel in your mind and drawing conclusions 
and just listening and absorbing, like children do, without any preconditions and without any of your interpretations. Try that out for a while and you'll see how it changes your thinking. That opens up channels of unconscious that's beyond you because it's not you. You're allowing something else to enter, enter into you. So it's like studying, when you open up a book to study. So I remember teaching, uh, even teaching, especially you teach adults who already have ideas developed. So you open up a book, you start reading a few lines, and everybody's weighing in on their opinions. And I always say, when I'm teaching, I say, listen, before we come to our opinions, let's read what this scholar has to say, or this sage, or this rebbe, or whatever. Let's read the page. Let's, let's hear what he has to say before we, it's like imagine him speaking. And before he finishes the sentence, everybody has their opinion. First listen, hear what the opinion is, and then you can argue, explain, and so on. I don't know if it's the fast food generation we live in, but there's something about patience that's lacking sometimes to be able to have that stepping back and absorbing. This is a critical component in, the, in accessing that unconscious. So I mentioned a few ideas, a few techniques rather, of how one can do it. It's all doable by any one of us. You don't need to be a special soul or some type of extraordinary skills. It takes willpower. It takes also commitment. It takes uh, a need to really say, this is what I'm going to do. So I would make a practical suggestion. It may be hard to apply a lot of this in relationships immediately. Because in relationships, things are very emotional and complicated. But it's not that hard to apply to academic, um, to academic growth. So if you're going to dedicate yourself to study something, say once a week, study a text, or um, go to a class and allow your mind at work where it's not threatening to you because it's, you know, it's just ideas to actually try this, this method, a new method which is trying to absorb an idea that's not you and not how you understood it. What was that person saying? Or what is that page saying? And then sit down and rewrite in your own words what you heard and see how close it is to the original. Precisely the opposite of what we would usually do, which is how I understood it. Don't do that. Do the opposite. What was said to you, and see how accurate you are in conveying that which was said. And you could always go to the page or show it to someone else and say, here's how I wrote it. Please read the page and tell me. How close am I to the page? How much is it me? And how much is it what, what was said to me? You'll see, when you are able to do that, ironically, you'll then be able to interpret it with much more profundity than if you interpret it without that first step. So that's something that I think everybody can try to do. If you really want to use an exercise, that's an unbelievable exercise. Now, whether you'll do it or not is up to you, and you don't have to report back to me um, unless you want to win the prize. Um, I didn't know we were offering a prize, but now that I think about it, uh, we'll figure out what the reward will be. But the truth is the biggest reward will be your own, and it's just an exercise in... Um, in, in really in vital and in strenuous in, in, in ex exertion healthy exertion and there's an interesting thing which I'll conclude with which is a very powerful concept the Zohar says in the book of beginning of Exodus it says that the Jews were working were hard labor the Egyptians in the bondage and slavery put them to hard to hard work and the expression used is that, that they were the that they were oppressed by working with chaymer and levenim, which is um, um, bricks and mortar. And that was their hard work. So the Zohar says something which is very odd. He interprets chaymer, do kal v'chaymer, and levenim, do libun hilchasa. To explain that means that the word chaymer, which means bricks in Hebrew, also has another meaning. It can mean harsh, and it can mean kal v'chemer. There's a certain methodology, uh, I think that's not a priori, but there's a certain methodology in thinking. A kal v'chemer means that you can derive a certain theory. If that this theory is applied to a more lenient case, you can learn from that that it's also so in a more harsher case. For example, um, if something is forbidden on Shabbos, it's definitely forbidden on Yom Kippur, because Yom Kippur is like a double Shabbos. So it's a method of thinking that we learn from a more lenient case, we can apply to a harsher, to a more, to a more, to a stricter situation. And then Libun Hilchase says the idea of crystallizing an idea, lavenim, which means mortar, 
also comes from the word crystallizing. So the question that's asked, the Balatanya asks the question, what connection is this? It's one thing you give an interpretation in a verse, a mystical interpretation, but what's the connection, bricks and mortar, to these two intellectual type of concepts? And he says the following, that we all have, we will all in our lives have to exert ourselves. No person is immune from having some strain in their life. The choice, however, is where you're going to apply that strain. Will it be in bricks and mortar, in very physical hardship, hardship, or will it be an intellectual hardship where you strain your mind and your heart to reach higher levels? And when you do so, you essentially have already been Yetzi, you already assumed and fulfilled your obligation for strain in this life. Which is a very powerful statement. Think about it for a moment. Some, although some of us think, like, why do I have to have it so difficult in my life? And he's basically giving a solution. He says, br br bring difficulty in a healthy area in your life, and you won't need to have difficulty in unhealthy areas. Which means, strain yourself and work hard in the areas of loving others, or in the area of, as I said, a, uh, of uh, academic excellence, or spiritual growth, and that will replace, in a way, the strain that we have in, this, in other areas of worrying about, let's say, our livelihood, or issues of health, or issues of relationships. So, there you go. You got yourself an option. Try it out, and let's see. Uh, and maybe, just to show a little example of it, it's, I read somewhere, I don't even know if it's true, if there are medical ex experts here, you can correct me, that why is it we itch, like, why is it that the times we itch are, when we feel something, we itch? Why do we itch? What does the itch help? You know, itches usually don't help anything. They usually make it worse. So I read somewhere that when you itch it, when you scratch it, you're basically uh, stimulating nerves that are more powerful than the pain itself. So like really just like in a sense um, uh, drowning out the pain. So it's like a, a bigger pain is taking away a smaller pain, so to speak. Anyone ever heard that? So well, it sounds good. Whether it's accurate or not, we'll have to check. We'll have to go to uh, Rabbi Google or Dr. Google and uh, figure that out. But... The idea is whether it's true or not with the itch, I don't know, but the concept definitely is correct. Sometimes, if someone has a headache, give them a bigger headache, and the, the smaller headache goes away. Now, I don't mean a bigger headache in a bad way. You know, get, if you have to take upon yourself a responsibility to help somebody, and it's really it's difficult for you to do, I guarantee it's going to take your mind off some other difficulties that are, are, are less necessary in your life. That's the point. So, my friends, the story is this. Each of us have a very profound reservoir of unconscious energy waiting to be released. However, you don't want to release it in any type of uh, artificial way or with foreign substances because then it uh, breaks the floodgates and, uh, and the Le and Le Levi's, what is the word? Levi's? Levi's? What was in New Orleans? Um, and it breaks the barriers in ways that are not healthy. But the methods that I suggested before, which are time-tested methods, are the way that true mystics and true scholars and true people of growth always figured out that that was the bittel and it was the exertion and the strain and it was love and joy that opened up new channels. Simcha pirates together as well. Though I mentioned, I just alluded, I'll just add it here at the end here, that it's a, a way of transcending ourselves is when you celebrate. Because again, it gets you out of your own mood. And the people that need most simcha are the ones that don't feel they need, don't say that, I, how could I be joyous? Those are the people that need the greatest joy. If you're joyous, obviously you don't need it. If uh, you aren't, that's the ones that need it most. And when you're, and you're able to introduce it into your life, it opens up channels as well. So, I just touched the tip of the iceberg, no pun intended, of the inner forces at work. And uh, we shall definitely resume this and have more to say. But the fact is that when you allow that uh, unconscious to express itself, it does change not just your perspective, and not just your return to moving away from pettiness, but it also opens up a whole new door and a whole new uh, way of looking at experiences and it definitely brings new blessings into our lives. So, that said, um, I want to wish everybody a very expansive week, a, a week where we channel new unconscious forces into our con conscious lives. Remember, the, di the deeper you dig, the more beauty you're going to find. So, it will add a lot of beauty to our lives. And I shall say as well that uh, this class is dedicated to my own dear father, whose yard site, fifth yard site, we just honored uh, and, uh, yesterday, actually. 
the 20th of year, um, five years ago. And uh, I, obviously I would not be here had he not been here before me. So uh, th that's that. And uh, I also want to say that uh, some people have asked me, so if anybody would like to make a contribution in honor of my father to help us continue our work, it's an opportune time. And uh, we will have, as we usually do, an annual lecture in honor of my father. It's not yet. We don't have the exact date. It will soon be announced. So that's about my father. And uh, what else? tomorrow night, Philip will be giving his class here at 7 p.m. As usual, creative spirituality. And I will continue, for those of you that have registered, or you can register, the third part of the Omer webinar that I'm doing, which, uh, thank God, is going very well. And that's, even though we're doing it actually in this location here, which is open um, to you, to all those that register, um, but it's also online. So it's really at the convenience of wherever you are, and even the sessions that we've done, the th previous ones are all available to anyone that is, is uh, registers will, will have be able to have access lifetime to that as well. So if you're interested, talk to Golda Malka at the front. That will be this uh, uh, Sunday, and then final session will be the next Sunday before Shavuos. And I shall be here again, hopefully, please God, next Wednesday, and uh, continue this uh, journey from the unconscious to the conscious and back and forth, and try to create some, uh, I guess, a few highways uh, that can go back and forth easily. So we can ultimately create a, uh, <coughs> an ultimate unity in this uh, pluralistic universe. So thank you, everyone. Have a very good week.